Our first speaker is Professor Andrew Day, who's a professor of psychology at Deakin University, which is sort of vaguely in the west. That's how you manage to commute occasionally um, to Adelaide. I live in Adelaide, but uh, the university is in Geelong and Burley yeah, in Melbourne. Yeah, so you yeah. managed to get there to and from because yeah. um, you previously worked at the University of South Australia as a psychologist for prison and mental health services. That's both in Adelaide and the UK. And research interests centre on the development of effective rehabilitation programmes for offenders, effective being the key word, with a particular focus on the treatment and management of violent offenders and the role that anger plays in serious violent offending. Would you please tell us about your work? Thank, Thank you, Robin. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Robin, and thank you, Kieran, for the invitation to talk tonight. Uh, my professional background is as a clinical psychologist who spent a lot of time working in uh, prisons, both in England for the Home Office and here in South Australia. I worked at Yatla Prison uh, for a while, uh, some years ago. Um, half of the prison population have, have been convicted of violent offences, and my interest in anger really um, stemmed from trying to understand the reasons why people commit violence and serious acts of aggression and violent behaviour and the role that anger plays in that. Um, anger is probably one of the most important emotions that we experience, because it plays such an important role in motivating our human behaviour. And yet I think all of us would agree it's one of the most poorly understood of all the emotions. If we look at the scientific literature, this is just the psychology literature, um, this is just a count of how many um, scientific articles have been published um, on the topic of anger. And the, the figures are quite old now, but we can see um, anger has received much less attention than other negative emotions. So depression has probably attracted most of the interest of psychological thought and research over the last uh, 40 years. Anxiety, not far behind. Psychologists haven't typically been very interested in anger as an emotion. Um, and that probably relates to the fact that there's not, anger is not a recognisable psychiatric disorder. Um, there's disorders of anger, disorders of depression. And there's only a few things in diagnostic categories that relate to anger control problems. Um, and, and typically psychologists don't work uh, routinely, other than the two people that are speaking up to me, in the area of anger management or working with violence. One of the reasons for this is that people don't often seek help when they've got problems with anger. And this is a quote that kind of I quite like about some of the problems in engaging angry clients. Um, angry people will always tell you about the problems that they have with other people or the things that frustrate them or annoy them or irritate them. And they're looking for people to sympathise or empathise with their position on that. And people don't see that the problem's with them. Um, they believe that they're justified in their anger and it's appropriate for them to feel, feel angry. So as we can imagine, not many people will go to a GP, a, a family medical practitioner, and say, I've got a problem with anger. I'd like to see someone to help me control my anger more, more effectively. What they're more likely to say is, this, problem makes me, this person makes me mad, this situation makes me mad. What can we do about changing them? I'll start though, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the work I do with, friend, with offenders at the end of the talk. But we should start really by thinking about what anger is. Anger is an emotion, it's an internal emotion, which we experience as an aroused state of antagonism or arousal. So we get physically aroused when we, when we get angry. We can see whether someone's angry from their facial expression. Um, we typically have, typically have different thoughts go through our minds. So we might ruminate about grievances. We might run over things that people have done wrong to us. That'll increase our physical arousal and make us more angry. The reason why psychologists are most interested in anger is really in relation to its um, association with aggression. Um, aggression causes a lot of harm to people in the community, and a lot of aggression is anger mediated. So when people get angry, the action tendency or the behavioral response that's associated with anger is aggression. So you try and enforce your will on someone else, and it's aggression that really causes people to seek help from psychologists. Um, Here's some frequently asked questions about anger. What are the causes of anger? What are the consequences of anger? And people are sometimes interested in gender differences. So are women less able or more able than men to experience or express anger in their lives? If you take a second, just maybe think back to the last time that you felt angry. Someone looked at their watch. <laughs> 
it would be interesting to go around the room and find out the sorts of things that people found made them feel angry. Did you think the person or the circumstance that triggered your anger could have done something differently? Probably yes. And most anger experiences relate to when people's goals are frustrated or they believe that someone did something intentional or on purpose or could have done something different. I wonder who it was you felt angry with. It's always interested me that the people we get angry with are usually the people that we love or care about most. We don't often get angry with people that we dislike. If we look at anger, anger in intimate relationships, it's a real, a real common problem and, re and relates um, to some serious problems with domestic and family violence against women. Second thing about the consequences of anger that I'm interested in is if someone gets angry towards us, most people would say that our respect for the other person grows rather than diminishes. So the person's status increases in our mind. So um, anger can be quite effective interpersonally. In relation to gender differences, generally women report feeling angry about as often as men. There's no difference if we ask people how often you get angry. Um, the difference in gender is really about whether anger is expressed or not. So women will be much less likely to express anger, and that would be about gender roles and how people have been socialised largely, I think. Um, and obviously men are much more likely to commit serious acts of aggression and violence. And most serious acts of aggression are perpetrated by men. Here's some statistics on cross-cultural comparisons about anger, which um, I, think, I think are interesting. So Italians, uh, Italians get angry probably amongst the most of all people in the world. Um, Chinese people rarely get angry. So if you, I mean, obviously there's, there's some differences with how you ask these questions, but if you ask Chinese people to express uh, you know, where they fit on, the, on a, a, a range from irritation, annoyance, anger, fury and rage, Chinese people would rarely report feeling angry, whereas Italians would often uh, report anger most uh, several times a day. I think the important point I'd like to make here is that it's not about how often we get angry that's a problem, it's about how strongly we feel the, mo the emotion of anger. So everyone will feel anger um, to different extents across the week or across the day, and um, it's when we feel very, very strong feelings of anger that it can create problems. And in my view, high intensity anger is nearly always dysfunctional. That's when it becomes associated with aggression or violent behaviour. We did... Um, some work a few years ago, just asking people about the language that they use when they're describing their anger. Um, and these are some of the metaphors that people use when they're commonly kind of just talking about um, how they feel when they get angry. Language is, I think, important for me from a clinical perspective because it offers insight into the way in which people conceptualise their anger and provides clues about the possibilities for change. So, for example, if someone talks about exploding with anger, then they may believe that they'll lose all control if they allow themselves to get a little bit angry and as a consequence, they'll avoid situations that could eventually provoke them. These are some of the me metaphors. I mean, it's interesting, again, to reflect on when we talk about anger ourselves, which are the metaphors that are most common, uh, common for us. And the most common metaphor is the idea of anger as heat. And we often talk about things like keeping our cool. And associated with the idea is, th is this idea of heat or pressure building up over time until we explode. So anger explodes or spills over in some ways from the top. Sometimes people also talk about their anger as a sign of insanity. So people say, I went bananas, I went mad, I lost the plot. Um, sometimes people talk about anger as something that weighs them down, I have to get it off my chest, and some catharsis kind of ideas that underpin that. Or even as a dangerous animal, my anger was unleashed. I think Michael might return to some of the language that people talk, talk about when they're uh, describing anger in his talk later on this evening. So that's just some stuff about normal anger, and I guess the point I'd like to make is that anger is normal, and anger is healthy. People use different language to talk about anger, and we shouldn't assume that if people get angry a lot, that's necessarily problematic, dysfunctional, um, or a cause for concern. So as I said earlier, my kind of um, interest is really um, in changing problematic anger, and particularly when anger is associated with uh, violent or aggressive behaviour. Important thing about when we're thinking about interventions for anger is to remember that anger serves some important protective functions, and it's important to understand this for treatments to be effective. I think it's particularly useful to understand the patterns that exist between different angry episodes. So as a psychologist, we typically ask people to describe a series of different times in which they felt anger, and then look for parallels or common themes that underpin uh, the provocation or the experience of anger and how people express that anger as a consequence. I also think it's important to think about the development of anger. So, um, um, were our parents angry? How did, they, how did we grow up? What, what rules did we learn about emotional expression 
in our families. And we call these kind of distal triggers. So these are the kind of the rules or the schema or the beliefs that we use to, to um, manage our emotions and solve problems or conflicts in our lives. And angry people often don't want to talk about that stuff. So there's an Im implied responsibility, uh, personal responsibility for a behaviour if we talk about, you now you get angry in the same way across these different situations and you've done this um, for most of your life. So let's talk about what happened in your early years when you were learning about anger and learning about emotional regulation um, and see if we can understand that pattern and then do something differently in the future. As I said earlier, most people want to tell you about why they're right to feel angry um, and why they were hard done by um, and the responses for their anger. I guess implicit in that is this idea that um, anger management or the treatment of anger requires some level of insight, self-awareness or motivation to change. Um, and often people who are referred for anger management feel pressured into treatment, so they're told to go there or they're asked to go there or their family or friends suggest that they need to do something about their anger and they don't see themselves as responsible for anger. So there's considerable challenges for psychologists in engaging people in a behaviour change process and, and having some agreement on why they're there and then recognising the problem. This is a description of what I mean by the term anger management and that's kind of a term that's moved into common language over, over recent years. There's lots of different types of anger management programmes. We'll hear, hear about one uh, way of treating anger later tonight. Um, but typically, kind of in my, in my experience, certainly in a forensic context, anger management would share these kind of four key, four or five key components. Um, first, they'd speak, seek to educate people about anger, what's normal and abnormal, what happens to our bodies when we get angry, um, how do our thoughts change, and so on, so to increase awareness and insight into what's going on. Often this is fo followed by some form of relaxation training to help control physio physiological arousal. So when you get angry, when you get wound up, when your body changes, how can you calm down, how can you breathe slowly, and how can you stop your thoughts racing? And then the main part of treatment would be asking participants to imagine or rehearse a whole range of situations in which they might get angry. And you'd ask them to focus on how they interpret what's going on and, and what's going through their mind at the time of the angry provoking situation. And the idea is that you can control your arousal and your behaviour by thinking differently or interpreting, interpreting a sequence of events differently where you're not making attributions of blame for the other person and you don't have the need to then overcome um, the wrongdoing that you perceive has happened. And then finally, most programmes will include some kind of general self-care or coping activity and often people with anger problems um, experience difficulties in a range of different areas in their life and, and have some need to kind of... Um, improve their general levels of, of well-being. Okay, uh, my, my own research interest is on anger in prisons, as I said, and in violent offenders, um, and particularly people who've committed serious violent offences. Um, we know that violent offenders are more angry as a group than other types of offenders, so if we give them measures of anger expression or trait anger, um, we know that prisoners score higher on those kind of questionnaires um, than, than non-violent prisoners and people in the community. And we also know that unlike other negative emotions, anger is an emotion that increases over the course of a prison sentence. So depression and anxiety is characteristic um, of people when they first arrive in prison, but as they adjust or become institutionalised, that diminishes over time. Anger, on the other hand, increases over time. So people leave prison generally more angry than when they arrived in prison. Um, anger also is associated with a whole range of problems in prisons, including prison assaults, disciplinary Instance and is usually rated by staff as one of the most difficult kind of emotions that, or behavioural problems that they have to deal with. Um, so there's a strong rationale for delivering anger management programmes in prison, um, although the main focus of most of the programmes is on this relationship between anger and aggressive or violent behaviour. So most prisons really dedicate a lot of their services now to rehabilitation, and the idea would be to deliver anger management programmes to violent offenders to reduce the risks of them committing further violence when they're released back into the community. There have only been a few studies that have looked at whether anger management actually works with offenders. Um, most of them have kind of been done by our, our research group here in South Australia and then later in Victoria. And in our studies, we assessed over 300 um, offenders in both prison and community corrections settings um, who had been referred to and received anger management programmes. And these were men, they were all men, um, who were resident in South Australia, Western Australia and Queensland. So there are three different types of programmes, um, but a similar kind of group, all of whom have been convicted of violent offences in the past. And we compared, we compared the changes in these men over time with a match group 
of offenders who didn't receive the programme. So another group of violent offenders, but they're on a waiting list to receive the programme and they hadn't had any formal intervention around their offending. Um, with some consistency, we were, we were fairly disappointed, I think, to find that the overall effects of anger management were small. Um, participants left the programme with an understand, more understanding of their behaviour, so their knowledge about anger improved. But there wasn't much evidence of changes that were likely to um, influence their subsequent risk of reoffending. So that whilst anger management is effective in community and clinical and mental health settings, it's shown to be a very effective kind of intervention. Um, its, effect, its efficacy with violent offenders is still yet to be established. And these days, violent offender interventions wouldn't just focus on anger, but there'd be a much broad, uh, broader and more intensive kind of suite of interventions that you'd deliver. So our conclusion then was that anger management shouldn't be used as a blanket intervention uh, for all violent offenders. But it is clear that some people do benefit, particularly those who are assessed at higher risk of offending. And in our view, these offenders require much more intensive programs um, than are typically offered under the rubric of anger management. Our main observation, though, was that violent offenders are a, a particularly heterogeneous group. You can't stereotype violent offenders. There's no such thing as a typical violent offender. And simply assuming that a violent offender has an anger problem is likely to be erroneous. To illustrate this, I'd just like to finish with a couple of quick case examples just to, um, I guess, um, show some of the difficulties that um, are around in equating anger with violence and some of the anger treatment needs of people that have committed serious offences. We can see from both of the cases that the men don't require help in controlling their anger better or in, indeed in managing their anger. Rather, the problems can be understood in terms of the opposite. They over-control their anger. So in the first case, Lawrence is someone that over-controls over the experience of anger. He doesn't allow himself to feel angry. Um, whereas the second case, so called Ronnie, experiences strong feelings of anger but doesn't express it. In both of these cases, it led to circumstances in which they experienced very intense feelings of anger uh, which were associated with extreme violence and they were serving long periods of imprisonment for their offences. So this, this is Lawrence. Um, Lawrence is a 35-year-old man who'd recently been convicted of murdering his girlfriend by bashing her to death. The murder occurred several weeks after Lawrence was told abruptly and unexpectedly that their relationship was over and that she'd found someone else. <coughs> Friends and work colleagues reported that he seemed agitated and withdrawn in the period leading up to the murder, but they were unaware of the behaviours that would suggest the presence of a formal psychiatric disorder. Lawrence had no previous history of psychiatric disorder, criminal behaviour or violence, and his own account of his personality, which was corroborated by others, was that he was a quiet, introverted, socially inhibited man who was low in anger, hostility and avert aggression. Staff observations during subsequent imprisonment painted a picture that was consistent with his self-report and he was unassertive and never expressed anger overtly. And during in-depth in interviews with his psychologist, he was resolute in his assertion that he rarely or never experienced anger and he didn't experience anger when he was told that the relationship was over. On psychometric tests of anger, Lawrence obtained very low scores, considerably, considerably below the mean for the general population. Let's compare Lawrence with Ronnie, uh, another man serving a life sentence for a murder. Um, Ronnie was also quiet, inhibited and controlled in his usual behaviour. He had no history of psychiatric disorder, criminality or violent behaviour. But his offence involved stabbing a long-term workmate in a kitchen in which they both worked. Ronnie was teased and bullied by his workmate over many months until on one particular occasion he exploded, he grabbed a kitchen knife and stabbed his provoker to death. Unlike Lawrence, Ronnie was able to fully describe a long history of angry experience and anger immediately prior to the offence. He experienced feelings of intense anger and inner turmoil prior to the stabbing. He was unable to express his anger appropriately and, and typically kept his feelings bottled in. So for Ronnie, there's a need to learn to express his anger more appropriately, whereas for Lawrence, the goal would be not to manage anger, but to learn to experience anger more appropriately. In conclusion then, um, I guess my observations are that anger is a particularly important and interesting emotion, both in terms of normal anger and when it becomes problematic. And we can only really understand problematic anger in reference to what might be normal anger. Um, there's been very little research conducted about everyday or normal anger. Um, some of the research I've talked about tonight was conducted 20, 25 years ago in America. And there's not been any research that I know of in an Australian context about the phenomenology of anger. We have done some research with Aboriginal men in prison. Um, and that's been interesting insofar as anger for that group appears to be much more politicised and much more related to experiences of chronic or complex trauma. 
conclusion, though, really is that anger, for me anyway, is a normal and healthy human emotion, which is problematic when it becomes very intense. And it's, de it's then and only then that it's likely to be associated with aggressive or violent behaviour. The positive news is that for most people, anger management is a very effective type of intervention. Although I guess my kind of warning here is that careful assessments needed when working with people who are extremely violent to ensure that treatment's appropriate um, to their particular needs. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That's fascinating. I wonder on what basis uh, with Lawrence and Ronnie you are engaged to help because surely they're in Nick for years. Mm -hmm. So you're helping them adjust to a prison life, are you, rather than the life afterwards, rehabilitation to, to society? Um, I guess in the, in the last kind of well, 10 or 20 years, really, the focus of correctional services has really been very firmly on rehabilitation. Um, so as soon as people arrive in prison, there's a very intensive and in-depth assessment of their offending, and that really forms the basis of the sentence plan. So um, the goals really of prisons aren't to help people adjust to life, but really to understand why they're there and to manage the risk of them coming back to prison when they're released. And after all, all prisoners, even if people are there for 20 or 30 years, will be released back into the community at some point in the future. Yeah, I just wonder about doing your job. If I was going into a prison, I would yeah. be saying, well, I'm going to prepare you for going back to normal life. But that's not going to happen for no. <laughs> some of these guys yeah. at all. So I just wonder how you go about dealing with someone who's going to be incarcerated for quite such a long time. Yeah. So the first point is about understanding their offending. And yes. then there's some, some intense psychological programs to try and help them do that and address the needs that may be, or the risk factors, as we call it, that are associated with their offending. As people move through a sentence and then come close to release, they go through a pre-release phase. So in South Australia, there's, a, there's a, um, the Cottages, which is a prison next door to Yatlow, where people can go into more independent living environments. Sometimes they get day release, although not so often these days because there's such public concern about those kind of systems. But, that, um, but then kind of, um, the idea is that people can overcome some of their institutionalisation and get used to normal living, um, find employment pathways, um, and really kind of have a chance to practice some of the skills that they learn in anger management and violent offender treatment programs. One of the problems with prisons are that they're very artificial environments. So there's, there's very exactly, strong yeah. rules about That's how right. men relate yeah. to each other, for example, in male prisons. Yeah, because if I went in there, I'd say, well, I, I hate the screws too. I understand what yeah. you're feeling. Yeah. <laughs> but do you feel something, uh, if you go to work every day, you know, the most frightening thing for me would be to know that yet again I'm seeing 10 angry men every day. Yeah. Do you find them similar in a way that you could express to us um, in type? I do probably. I mean, I think like, men who are extremely violent often have very high moral standards. So some of the violence is about trying to make the world the perfect world that they'd like it to be. Um, particularly that's the case with men that are violent against women. Um, at the same time, violent men have a very strong sense of entitlement, so they believe it's their responsibility and their right to intervene when they see wrongdoing. And often serious violent offences are um, attempts to redress the balance in some way. So there's been some threat, um, real or imaginary, to a family member or someone they care about. Um, there's been some loss of face or some threat to self-esteem. Uh, and they will intervene, like over-intervene, impulsively and physically, violently, as a way of trying to control that. And that's where they get into trouble, and that's why, where offences are often committed. So there's no particular pattern like uh, you mentioned with Lawrence and Ronnie, where they are much more subdued, much quieter than normal. Mm -hmm. You see people who, instead of being full of heat, as you imply, yeah, yeah. <laughs> are in fact very cool and yeah. enclosed. Yeah. I, I was inter I'm, I'm, the reason why I chose Lawrence and Ronnie is in some ways they're not typical. It's that they're men that... Um, over control their anger and there's an assumption with violence that, that it's about temper control uh, and there'd be a small group of very violent men who, whose problems can be understood uh, mm. in, in the opposite way um, and my, the warning there is that you shouldn't be offering kind of management or control strategies to men that over control or over manage their emotions already and that's really something that uh, a level of sophistication that doesn't filter through into prison based programs at the moment mm. because they tend to be very kind of um, systematic in the way they deliver standardised programmes and there's not the individual kind of attention that you might find in a mental health service. Two more quick questions, one of them being uh, 
I was surprised by the flat line you had for anger versus the others. Yeah. I thought that anger management was an explosive industry, you know, with yeah. any amount of profile, but no. And there's certainly been a lot of exposure for anger management. I think um, one of the biggest programs in the world was the American Post Office um, <laughs> invested really heavily in anger management for all postal workers because they had such problems in the workplace about that. The airline people, I imagine. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, finally, you know, to talk personally, I am used to feeling angry in certain ways and using it to surf as a writer. I know I'm going to turn a tiny bit of rage into a script and so yeah. I'm using it really to give myself a bit of a push creatively because I know I can mm -hmm. and I know I haven't lost my temper in any way that's counterproductive <laughs> since I was a teenager mm -hmm. and I'm now 67 so <laughs> do you find that creative energies can be channeled in that way? Absolutely I mean I think one of the themes that will emerge from tonight is that anger and wrath energizes and motivates us to achieve our goals and to address wrongdoings. It's not something that's necessarily problematic. Yeah. Thank you.